and preparing. It is preparing to live stream eventually as the uh, red bar just kind of grows across the screen, kind of maybe. Mm. Done, redirecting to YouTube. All right, awesome. Okay, and I think we are live right now. Yes, yes, we are live. That's what it's telling me. So great. Thank you, Dr. Robert Glover, for uh, joining me. This is the CS Joseph podcast. I'm your host, CS Joseph. And uh, I'm so very excited because uh, Dr. Robert Glover has been a huge influence on my work uh, ever since I read uh, his book, Nor Mr. Nice Guy. And I think it's been, gosh, four years since I've read that book. And uh, you have additional books out i saw dating tips for men was out recently what else came yeah. out or is that it uh, or? That, that's the other one dating essentials for men and uh I'm working on a few more simultaneously which is not a great way to write a book because you don't ever get done with one of them so yeah. um yeah so between no more mr nice guy dating essentials for men and uh that's what's out there for right now awesome yeah, I, I really think I really think it's important because, you know, especially within the context of this audience, uh, a lot of people uh, come to my audience to basically figure out how to optimize their relationships in some way, shape or form. Sure. Obviously, you know, Tony Robbins is like, oh, health, wealth and relationships, are the main markets. But we're really focused on relationships here. It could be for career, parenting, sexuality or even personal growth, like the relationship with oneself you know, those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, uh, we're just, we're trying to come up with, you know, as much as we talk about nature and human nature from a psychological standpoint, there's so much more to it on the nurture side. And we utilize you as a resource um, with your books, basically, to kind of help answer the nurtural component of relationships and optimizing relationships. And I think it's been really helpful to especially a lot of the men in our audience on a consistent basis, especially like when they're trying to uh, get to a point where it's like, hey, I need to make myself a priority. I need to right. enforce boundaries. Uh, that boundary enforcement, it was, I mean, that was huge for, for me. I, I really struggled with that. I, I, I didn't <laughs> learn about boundaries. I was in my mid thirties in my second marriage and already had a PhD in marriage and family therapy. I'd never heard of boundaries. So uh, that's, a, that's a great topic. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, so, so when you're, when you're, uh, when you're doing uh, learning about boundaries and you, and you got all that education about like, where, like, how did it hit you? How did it hit you at that moment? You know? Oh, it, it was it was a two by four upside the head. What had happened is I had um, I had started into counseling, and I, I was married at the time to my second wife, and she said, "You you've got to go get help. You got to go get therapy. I I can't stand your passive aggressiveness anymore." And I didn't even know what passive aggressiveness was, and um, I just thought, "Well, you're the one that's angry and upset and moody all the time. I try to do everything to make it better. How come I'm the one that needs help?" But I, uh, I, I got lucky. I fell into some good helpers, one of which was a 12-step group for sex addicts, in which I quickly found out I wasn't a sex addict, but it was a great group to start just opening up with men. It was my first men's group, really, and to start really releasing shame and, and, and doing a lot of uh, work around my, uh, that began my nice guy recovery work. But around that same time, I also found a counselor, a woman, who I remember the very first session I had with her, it was, it was in her home, she had an office in her home, down in the basement. And in our first session, she got this string out, put it on, a ground, on the ground and started to introduce the concept of boundaries to me. Now, I don't know if she could just read me that well that she had no, she could tell I had no clue what boundaries were or if she did that with every one of her clients. But it, it was one of those monumental pieces in beginning to change, you know, how I approach the world, how I approach relationship. And, uh, you know, since that time, I've really come to understand that nobody knows about boundaries because we all grow up where we all come into the world. We're little, we're helpless. And the big people get to do whatever they want to little people. That's just the way it's always been and always will be. And uh, parents don't teach their children to set boundaries. 
Um, when children start trying their best to do a little bit of differentiation and boundary setting at about age two, when they say, no, myself, I don't want, I'm, we call that the terrible twos. So when children actually assert themselves, we call it terrible. So I don't know any society on this planet that actually teaches children how to grow up to be boundaried adults. Um, so we all just grow yeah. up to be adults and think, oh, this is how the world works. The, the big people get to do what they want to the little people. Do you think that has a lot to do with the Western society's cultural conditioning, not just towards feminism, but also like, because I've always figured that it might seem like there's a lack of personal sovereignty, like the concept of personal sovereignty uh, is just, you know, laid at the feet of, you know, cultural unity. And because of cultural unity, if you don't, if you're not acting like the rest of the pack in sure. some way, shape or form, uh, then you, you don't get a say, you don't even have rights at that point. And it yeah. seems like, you know, I don't think that's just Western culture. I, I, I think in Eastern culture to this day, they're much more emotionally fused within family and cultural systems that, and my definition of fusion is you belong to us, therefore you should. You should think like we think, feel like we feel, want what we want, do the way we tell you to do it. And differentiation is the ability to ask ourselves, what do I want? What feels right? What's important to me? And then follow through on that, even when there's pressure from the outside that says change, you know, con con conform, and the pressure between our ears in terms of anxiety and neurotic guilt that I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to get cast out of my family. I'm going to get cast out of my church. I, I don't. I'm not aware of any culture that says, think for yourself. It's a good thing. We support you. And no society support. wants to be wise. <laughs> well, you know, uh, whether we're talking about government or, or, or religion or even families, you know, the core piece is about keeping control and order and keeping the people who have the control in place of keeping their control. So anything that would threaten that, like a child saying myself, or I want to, or no, um, it feels threatening. And, you know, again, I, I, my, my background is in marriage and family therapy. And it just amazes me that we treat children as these little possessions that we get to, you know, manage them, shape them and turn them into what we think they should be rather than looking at children and saying, who is this human being? And how can I best nurture their own process to being their best self and having their best life? Um, we, we don't tend to think of parenting in that way. And I, I don't know any cultures that do. Um, so yeah, it's often, you know, we're in our thirties before we ever read a book or go to a counselor and they teach us about boundaries and differentiation. How, how did you get to the point though? Like it's one thing to know your boundaries or to establish them. It's another thing to enforce them. And, but you said something very interesting a few moments ago, you said something about follow through. Yeah. How did you get to that point where you're, developing the personal willpower or the personal endurance basically to be able to get to that point where you have that fall through because in my life that's been one of the most difficult things for me sure. you know uh, to finish what i start for one but even to have that fall through because for a while like especially my first marriage i was I was always afraid. I was always afraid of losing what I had or something right. like that. Right. And I would never really follow through with my threats or whatever. And I had to get to the point where I had absolutely nothing to lose. And I would rather live in my car than deal with this crap. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, well, how, that's, how that? you, you just actually nailed it. You, you, you spoke the, the, the part that um, I, I was uh, actually up in Seattle for a couple of weeks. And just got back down to Puerto Vallarta a couple of days ago. And I was driving in my car in the song uh, Janis Joplin. She died 50 years ago, they said, uh, or in October, uh, saying bought me and Bobby McGee. And there's a line in there by a song written by Chris Christopherson. And he says, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And, and I've always oh, yeah. that line, because like you said, when you had nothing left to lose. So here's the deal. I mean, there's so many, there's so many layers and components to boundary setting. Uh, and we can dive as far into this as you want, because I love the subject. Um, but here's the thing about boundaries. If we are afraid of losing, if we're attached to a specific outcome, i.e. We, we don't want to be yelled at, or we don't want our partner to leave us, or we want our partner to have more sex with us, or we want our partner to quit spending so much money. 
if we if we get as soon as we get attached to outcomes, especially to the attachment of, of either we don't want to upset somebody and or we don't want someone to leave us, we lose all our power. Because the I've, I've said for years, the ability to set a boundary is built on our both our willingness and ability to remove ourselves from that situation. That's why children cannot set boundaries. They can't remove themselves. They just don't have the power. What's a three-year-old, a seven-year-old going to do? Mom, pop, I'm out of here. I'm going to go live on the streets in Santa Monica, you know, dumpster diving. I'm taking the dog with me and life will, <laughs> probably, you know, <laughs> life, life will probably get easier if I don't have to put up with this bullshit at home anymore. Um, you know, you, you, you just don't do that. Kids don't think in terms of that. So you've got to be willing to remove yourself. So that's where I bring in kind of the, the, the Buddhist idea of non-attachment. And, and one of my definitions right. of non-attachment is being equally okay with every possible outcome. That's, I, and, and once, when I can operate in any context where I, I emotionally am equally okay with any possible outcome, I, I'm fucking Superman. I can do whatever it is that needs to be done. Do you think that's similar to Bruce Lee's be like water philosophy? Why not? Why not? Yeah, because yeah. it's we get rigid when we get attached. You know, but Buddha right. said that, that attachment's the cause of all suffering. I add to that, it's also the cause of all anxiety and the cause of all non non-action. Because we get attached, well, I don't want this thing to happen, so I better manage it this way, or I better not say anything, or I better keep a low profile. And a lot of that depends on kind of what our natural inclination is when, when we feel threatened, whether it's to fight, freeze, or flee. And, and so a lot of it gets manifested according to, you know, some people, when they get threatened, they, they come out fighting. Some of us keep a low profile and try to make it better. Some leave. So boundaries are, are really, they're, they're such a powerful um, dynamic in, in, you know, being, being a, a fully differentiated adult. Well, we can ask ourselves, what do I want? And then hold on to that. Now, again, if we cannot remove ourselves, if, if we are too frightened, if we're too scared, if we think, well, I'll never get another person this good, or I'll never get a job again like this. Um, yeah, that's, we're now attached. We've lost all of our power. But if we can be equally okay, if we can say, you know, hey, if this person leaves me over this boundary, I'll be okay. And I know I'll, I'll, I'll find another great relationship or, you know, if I stand up to my boss over this, all the hours he's making me work, if I say, hey, no, I'm not going to work that many hours. You know, if, if he says, well, OK, good. I'm glad you stood up to your line. Great. If he says, well, we'll find someone else who will. You're out of here. Great. Now, again, that's hard. That's, how, that's hard. It's easier to say than do. But I actually believe it opens the doors for better life situations. I, I, right. I will often refer to trying to redecorate a pigsty. You know, we're, we're not in the best relationship. <laughs> if I can just manage it and, re, you know, set these boundaries, it'll be better. Or if I'm not in the best job, but if I can just get my boss to go being such an ass, then, then I'll be able to put up with it. But it's still a pigsty. We've just, you know, remodeled it and put up, you know, some new paneling and new shag carpet. But it, it, when we actually are willing to walk away from situations that do not serve us at, at, at our best, it opens the door for situations that do and, and relationships that do. So, so huge. Yeah, I, that's fantastic. It, it kind of makes me think a little bit about, um, so a, a lot of, um, so I host a, I host a, a men's group within uh, this community and uh, we were doing a, um, a lot of, of your work, everyone is required to read Norm, Mr. Nice Guy, for example, and a myriad of other books to get in. And one of the books that we had to, to read was, uh, we actually have it all, all of them in, but the Red Pill books are also a lot of the men that have read, but there's one concept that I absolutely love uh, within those books, and that's the definition of personal power. How a man needs to get to a point where he realizes that real power, it's not about money or status, necessarily decision making or having all these things. Real power is the ability to change one's own life circumstances on a whim for any reason at any moment and be okay mm -hmm. with the outcome and be able to still move forward with the outcome. And it sounds like that's very similar to your Buddhist philosophy of non-attachment. And then you're adding onto it, um, source of anxiety and what was the other one uh of all non-action and non -action. i really came to that working with men around dating 
where, you know, if a man gets attached, I don't want to look foolish or I want that woman to like me or I want to make sure then, you know, once we get attached, our anxiety level goes up because, oh, what if I do look foolish? What if I do get rejected? What if she doesn't want to go out with me? So then we often do nothing. Most of us do not act in the face of anxiety. We just, we shut down or we just, we overthink it for some time and get caught up in the paralysis of analysis. So yeah. that, 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 that inability to, to know, I'll handle whatever happens. I'll handle it if I get rejected. I'll handle it if this woman screams at me because I don't do it her way. I'll handle it if my boss says you're fired. If I know I can handle any given situation, I mean, again, what, what greater superpower could we have than that? Because then we get to be really the, uh, we get to control our own destiny. Yeah, I, I really think that's really the key. The thing is, though, is that like we got we got people out there uh, who oftentimes uh, think um, I'd probably say maybe about 25 percent of the population, at least amongst men who think that they have to deserve those things first before they get to that point. Like, right. what would you recommend for those men out there who are plagued by like they need they need like another man to give them permission to behave the way that they're they're supposed to be naturally inclined to or in this situation you know given the society yeah well we might be dealing with a couple couple of subjects in that question one okay. yeah I, I i i like that you use the word deserve um i do not let my clients use the word deserve um where i really think the terminology came from was out of kind of women's empowerment that you know where, where women we're conditioned for so many centuries to basically serve and give and make sure everybody else's lives are okay and to sacrifice their own. And so the women's empowerment movement started using this term deserve. You deserve a spa day. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to go get your nails done. You, you know, you deserve, you know, this cup of tea or what, whatever it was. And, and it was like, it was the only way, you know, they, that, you know, people could figure out how to get women to actually, treat themselves well. But what I don't like about the concept of deserving is that it's a two-edged sword. Um, it's just as easy to say, I don't deserve a spa day. What, 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 what makes me think I deserve a spa day? What makes me think I deserve to, you know, take a day off? And so I don't like the word deserve at all. It, 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 we don't or deserve anything. Yeah, we, 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 you know, we, we deserve to be fucking dead, really. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, so <laughs> to, use the, to use the word deserve keeps us just as stuck and just as in a, just as a tenuous situation of what if tomorrow I don't deserve a spa day? I do today, but I don't tomorrow. So I, I, I tell my clients, let's get the word deserve out of it and ask yourself, what do you want? Well, you know, I, I want this. I want to go do this. I don't want to do that. That's what we weren't allowed to do at two years old. And that's really all we're having to, to relearn to do is what do I want? Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, and what we want doesn't have to make sense. And it doesn't have to be approved of by anybody else. An example I'm going to give is that for some reason, I, I got this harebrained idea um, that it'd be really cool to have an older, really fast Mercedes. And, and I, I don't want to have it down here in Mexico because as my wife says, she don't want to give anybody a reason to put a gun to her head and say, give me your keys. So, um, so but my, I go visit my mother up in Seattle quite a bit. And, and I thought, well, I just leave a car there because I, I make a lot of trips up to Seattle. And so um, I went online and I found this 2007 Mercedes-Benz ML63 AMG. It is, the, it is the, the fastest naturally aspirated V8 engine ever put in a grocery getter. So I, I, I did some research on it and you know, it's, it's, it's a great vehicle. And I found one, like I said, it's 13 years old, but it had less than a hundred thousand miles on it. It was in Springfield, uh, Illinois. I'm in Puerto Vallarta. I was gonna be heading up to Seattle a few weeks ago. So I got, got to doing some research on it and I thought, you know, I really like this car. And I, and I had a friend in Springfield, I said, can you go drive it? Well, he drives an ML. So he went and drove it. It says, great car. And so I told my wife, I said, hey, what do you think? I showed her the video. I just showed her a picture of the car online. And she said, that's a cool car. And I said, what do you think? Let's go to Seattle, fly to Chicago, go pick up the car and drive it for five days, 2,200 miles, eight states, back up to Seattle, leave it there. And she goes, cool. So, you know, she, she thought it was a great idea. 
But the thing was, I didn't need anybody's permission. I'm 64 years old. If I want to go buy a 13 year old Mercedes Benz, the fastest, you know, grocery getter that, that you can buy, they build it to compete with the Porsche Cayenne Turbo, right? And, and it's, it's, we drove it for 2,200 miles. We had a great time. It's a beautiful vehicle, rides well. And you know what? Should I've gotten it? Should I've not gotten it? There's no, there's no standard that measures other than I thought, hey, this car costs ninety thousand dollars new. It's like new. I got it for fourteen thousand dollars, and all I had to do was drive it back up to Seattle and then clean out my mom's garage so there'd be room to get two cars in her garage. And you know what? It was an adventure. It was fun. I'm thrilled that I did it. Is it the right thing to do? The wrong thing to do? Who the fuck knows? Right? There's yeah. no, there's no standard. But the thing was, I wanted to. I wanted to. I thought it'd be cool to have a car like that. I can afford it. I can afford to maintain it. And I thought, and you know, I leave it at my mom's house. Why not? So that to me is is mature adulthood. Is it you get to do what you want to do? And and what I've often done in my men's groups over the years is that if somebody's like caught up in that deserve thing, like, well, uh, yeah, I don't know if I should, or what if my parents are upset, or what if, you know, my girlfriend or my wife or my church or whatever, and, and I'll go around the room and, and I'll go, um, who's, who's the youngest person in this room? And it's usually somebody that's 26 or 32 or something like that. And I'll ask the entire group, okay, is, is you know, Joe here at 26, is he old enough to be a full-fledged adult? You know, and everybody looks at me like I'm weird and go, well, yeah, of course he is. And I go, okay, that means everybody in this room is old enough to be a full-fledged adult. And I said, what was the promise you made to yourself when you were three, five, seven, 12 years old, and your parents weren't letting you do what you wanted to do? What was the promise you made to yourself that when I get to be an adult, fill in the blank, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's what we all promised ourselves at 12. When I'm an adult, I'm going to do what I want. And then we get to be adults, 26, 32, 64. It doesn't matter. And we still go looking for permission from other people to do what we want to do. Or we have to convince ourselves we deserve it. I don't deserve a Mercedes Benz ML63 AMG. I don't deserve it. I wanted it. Right. And I could, I could afford it. I could buy it. I could get it to Seattle. So, I, I like to keep this as simple as possible. What do you want? If it's important to you, go for it. What if the entire world says, oh, you shouldn't do it that way? Well, they can do it the way they want to do it. You get to do it the way you want because you're a full-fledged adult. And I believe we're not going to feel like full-fledged adults until we start living that way, until we start living the way we want, and then starting to hear all those messages from around us. Well, what if everybody else lived that way? Well, we yeah. probably have a we probably have a lot happier planet if everybody else lived that way as well. Oh yeah, that's that's for sure. You also you also mentioned you also mentioned something earlier. I call it uh, well, at least my 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 um, my mentor uh, Robert Bryant used to call it. Uh, he'd say uh, he'd call it blowback, and how when you make those decisions. You're making yourself your mental point of origin. You you're, you you do the thing that you want because you're an adult. You're, you're he says you're a grown ass man. You can make that grown decision. Grown ass man, I love you it. know. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Uh, but the problem is, is that I mean, I in my uh, in my 20s, I started making those decisions, and I ended up being thrown out of my family, thrown out of my community, thrown out of my church, uh, mm -hmm. just completely thrown out. And it congratulations. Was, yes. <laughs> And I even ended up homeless for a while, even after the fact, after being thrown out. Um, but I, I will admit that even though I had suffered a lot of blow, blowback, uh, lots of public shaming, destruction of my own personal uh, reputation in the process, um, I was happier. Uh -huh. Even though I was suffering so much blowback from so many different sources, I was happier, but then I realized, you know, those people didn't necessarily have to be in my life. And then, and then I was homeless again, uh, for like the third time and having to deal with, um, you know, that, but eventually I was able to get back up on my feet and keep going. But at the end of the day, is that something I regret? Absolutely not. Mm -mm. But there are so many people who are afraid of the blowback. And I wouldn't say my, the blowback I faced was really, really severe because 
physically, I was never put in like physical danger with the exception of like, just, you know, maybe the homelessness aspect of it. But there are other people who do have real physical threats, you know, when sure. they are having to deal with low back and whatnot. What, what is it that people need to understand, be it men or women, or maybe if it's just men, especially because they really struggle making themselves their own mental point of origin within Western society, at least, right? Maybe not so much Eastern society, or maybe mis- Middle Eastern society is probably more accurate. But the difference is, is that when, when you're in that situation, like, how do you how do you manage blowback appropriately? Are you just cutting people out of your life? Are you adding a new people? Are you going to be solo and your own for a while like what what would be a recommended process from your point of view and how to manage blowback when you right. finally decide enough's enough i got nothing to lose i'm making this decision <laughs> you know i and that's a good question and that, that relates really closely to one you asked before is how how do you um maintain your boundaries over time because that's that's the main thing that causes us to let our boundaries down is, is that blowback is, is that change back messages. So um, give you an example. When, when I was doing a lot of couples work back in private practice, um, I, I, I taught, you know, a lot of couples about boundaries and, and often it was the nice guy part of the couple who was, you know, saying his wife does this and his wife does that. And, you know, usually the wife would say, why don't you stand up to me? <laughs> or, you know, why don't you just tell me you don't like that? And the guy's going, I can do that. And, you know, the woman's going, yeah, I don't want to feel like I can walk all over you. And I, you know, yeah, I can, I can be a bitch sometimes, but I don't, I don't want you to think you have to put up with that. And so I would teach the guys about boundaries and I would show them what that therapist showed me. I'd put a string on the ground and I'd say that, I said, stand over there on that side. That's your, that's your territory over there. This line's a boundary. And I'd tell them, I'm going to walk across the line I'm going to put my hands on your shoulders. I'm going to begin to push you backwards. When you begin to feel uncomfortable, stop me. And um, how I did that when the therapist did it with me, I was about two feet back from my line because I had no clue what a boundary was or where I could even set a line. When she walked across, put her hands, started pushing me back. I said, okay, stop. She kept pushing. I said, okay, you can stop now. She kept pushing. And about the time my back was to the wall, I finally dug my feet in and got a little bit of a, you know, a lineman stance and kind of put my hands on her shoulders and I stopped her and she smiled and said, okay, good. And I'm thinking, okay, good. What, what are we talking about here? So what, when I would teach men that with like their, their partners watching and I would teach them how their partner will feel safer if he has boundaries, boundaries with her, boundaries with his ex-wife, boundaries at work, boundaries in other contexts, that she'll feel safer. And, um, and so I've talked with the men about setting those clear boundaries. And I had women literally applaud when, when I teach the guy to, her husband to set boundaries, her boyfriend. And the guys would all like slack jawed, look at their partner and say, you mean you want me to stand up to you, dear? And the women said, no, I do. I don't want to be married to a guy that lets me walk all over him. And I've heard that so many times. And then I would tell the guy, I said, she's telling you the truth. She doesn't want to walk all over you. And, yet, and it actually makes her feel bad and unsafe when she can't. My, my second ex-wife used to say to me, how do I know you can ever stand up f- uh, for me if you can't even stand up to me? It made her feel unsafe when I didn't have boundaries. And so I, I tell the guys, you know, if you start setting the boundaries, your wife or girlfriend, whatever, might push back against them and might resist the boundary you set. And then you're probably going to say to her, but dear, in Dr. Glover's office, you applauded when I said a boundary. I thought you want me to set boundaries. And I tell the guy, and she's going to say to you, I do want you to set boundaries, just not this one. Right? So that that's the blowback we're going to get. And, and it, it is it is often going to happen. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes we set a boundary. We say to a person, hey, man, you're standing on my foot. And, you know, they say, oh, hey, I'm sorry. Didn't even realize it. That's what most boundary violations are between people is that a person does something they don't even know it's hurting another person. And if we just tell them, you know, without attacking them, they say, hey, man, you're on my foot. That hurt. Oh, sorry about that. You know, okay, sure. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt you. Now, sometimes we'll tell people, Hey, you're on my foot. And they'll go, you know, what, huh? And just start pushing harder on your foot. And you might say, Hey, you're on my foot, get off. And you know, they might say, fuck you asshole, man up. Don't be such a baby. And we'll get all kinds of responses. But I tell people boundaries are not about getting other people to be different. They're about getting us to be different. Sometimes just saying you're on my foot 
they respond. Sometimes saying you're on my foot and then they keep their foot there, you might have to use just as much uh, resistance as is necessary to move your foot out from underneath theirs. And if it's somebody that keeps stomping on your foot with regularity, you might want to consider not hanging around them. Okay. Now to go back to your question, when I learned about boundaries and, and one of the first people I really started setting them with significantly was my mother. Um, I was in my mid thirties and my wife started pointing out the ways my mother violated my boundaries. And um, every time I talked to her on the phone was around her, she started complaining about my father. And, you know, so I set a boundary, mom, I'll talk with you about anything, but we've been complaining about dad since I was old enough to hear you complain about dad. I said, he's my dad. You know, uh, you're still married to him. I, I, let me have my own relationship with him. But every time we talked, she'd bring up my dad. I say, mom, I'll talk with you about anything but dad. And she would even like bring up their sex life and this, mom, I'm not gonna talk about that. She guilted me, she kept pushing through it. She got passive aggressive. She even told me her therapist said I was being controlling because I wouldn't let her complain about my dad in our conversations. I'm going, yeah, what, what, what'd you tell your therapist anyway? So <laughs> we, we got to the point where um, I, I just finally had to remove myself. I did not talk to my mother and father for 15 years, 15 Dang. years. And um, that was painful and it was hard. I grew a lot during that time. Now I, I reached out and reconnected with my father after about 15 years and, and you know, got, got to be at peace with his limitations as a human being. And I, I was in a good place with him when he died of a stroke 11 years ago. Well, when he had the stroke, he was in the hospital in hospice for about two weeks. And I, uh, the hospice hospital room was three blocks from my office. So I spent a lot of time around my mother and my dad in, in hospital bed in hospice as he was dying. And my mother and I hashed out everything that had gone on over, you know, that had led up to the problem over the last 15 years. And that was 11 years ago. And I would say now that we have a, a, a supportive boundary relationship. And I've come to accept her imperfections as a human being. Um, she can't say, I love you unless you say it first. She won't give a hug, you know, unless you give it first. She cannot give praise you know, to save her life. She can criticize, you know, constructive criticism. And I just smile and laugh at her. So when I took her for a ride in my, in my new Mercedes the other day. Um, her one comment was, this is a really comfortable car. I'm going, no fucking, yeah, it costs 90,000 new. It weighs 5,000 pounds. It's a tank of a car, and it, you know, with a dragster engine in it. I said, it's a very comfortable, you know, I, I just smiled and said, yeah, it is comfortable. <laughs> uh, that's my mother, but, but it's boundaried now. And, and I can go visit her and, and go stay with her. And, and, and we, we have a, a loving, supportive relationship. And, you know, she gets along with my wife and my wife gets along with her. They don't even speak the same language, but, but they get along because of the work that's been done. And so um, I'm not saying everybody, you know, if you have to not talk to your family for 15 years, I'm not saying everybody has to do that. And I'm not saying everybody will at some point make it better again. I don't know. Again, if we get attached to we want a certain outcome of this, we, we won't have the strength or the persistence to, to be boundaried. But the one rule of, well, two, a couple other rules of thumbs of boundaries. One is that I don't hang out with people who don't treat me well. I just don't do that anymore. And so now my life is filled with people who treat me well. And I, yeah, it, once I just decided no one's ever going to treat me badly again, uh, my life got a lot better. Now, the other thing I'll add to this about boundaries is that I think the best boundaries are the ones that invite other people into higher consciousness. You know, instead of saying, hey, you're being an ass, you need to stop doing that. To, to, to say, you know, ouch, that hurt. Did, did you mean it to? You've now invited them actually to get conscious. Uh, well, you say it hurt you. No, I, I didn't mean hurt you. I, I apologize. Or, you know, come to think of it, I have been pissed off at you. I think I did mean it for you to hurt. Um, so it invites people to higher consciousness if we do it as open heartedly and elegantly as, as possible. So boundaries are what allow people to get close to us. I, I use the analogy is like on a highway. You've, you've got, you got markers on the road, white markers, yellow markers, you got signs, stop signs, speed limits, yield signs, you got stoplights, you got crosswalk. Those are all boundaries that allow a lot of cars 
to coexist in close proximity at high rates of speed without all crashing into each other. So boundaries allow us to coexist in, in a crowded culture. And they allow us to let people get close to us because if we don't have boundaries, we either have to avoid people altogether or keep walls up with them. So boundaries are great. You know, I think a lot of people approach boundaries like, oh no, I'm gonna have to set a boundary and people are gonna get pissed off. No, boundaries let people in. They let people get close to us because we get to determine as adults who comes in, how far they come in, what they get to do while they're in there and when it's time for them to leave. But if we can't decide those things, we can't ever let them in. Right. Okay. So I really like what you said about, ouch, that hurt. Did you mean it to? Um, so people like me, we really, uh, so people like me, like psychologically speaking, I'm so focused on trying to, to find the, the, the best way to do something, the absolute best way to do something. And then sometimes I end up sacrificing myself for the sake of finding the best way to do something or someone else who might be more interest-based. And those types of people are like, oh yeah, as long as I get mine, it's all good. And they're aware of what I get out of the situation. They're aware of what they get out of the situation. And it's kind of more transactional, but I don't have that awareness. And it took me a long time to just develop this habit of, Chase, anytime you have any contact with any human being, even if it's your spouse or your children, ask yourself this question, what are they getting out of it compared to what you know, uh, they're getting out of it. And if they're getting more out of it than you are, they're manipulating you and they may not know that. So it's your responsibility to talk about it and bring that up. And it kind of sounds like, you know, ouch, that hurt. Did you mean it to? And it's one, it's a, it's a habit that I've developed personally to allow myself to expose, potentially expose people who are actually trying, like willfully trying to take advantage. I mean, there's people out there who don't know that they're doing it and that's fine. And we'll talk about that and it's great. And we'll move forward. And then I find out, oh man, that person really is trying to screw me over. I should probably not let them in my life. And it gives me an opportunity to identify an area where my boundary needs to be enforced because I mean, yeah, I can have all these walls up and whatnot, but if I'm not paying attention to what's happening to the walls, you know, and that's one of the issues that I've had. I, I, I struggle with paying attention to where the boundaries need to be enforced. Yeah. And that's the question most people ask me, you know, about boundaries. Well, how do I decide where they go? And I said, I just tell people it's really a gut feel issue. Really, if something feels bad to you, probably you need to say something not just keep putting up with it. But I don't know of any golden rule book that says, here's where everybody's line should be. Here's where, where your boundaries should go. Some people can let stuff just wash over them. Other people take everything personally. I mean, and, and so I, I tell people, you, you, it just takes practice. It often takes a support system. You asked about that a little bit earlier about what it takes. I don't know that I could have learned to set boundaries if, if I was not working in a men's program and having a therapist who were like supportive of something I did not learn when I was two, five, 12 years old. I was relearning something in a, in a context and, and they often feel life and death because for a child, standing up to the powerful people means you could get squashed, right? And it feels life and death. And we bring that same emotional energy into adulthood and we tend to attract people into our lives that recreate those old familiar emotional systems. And now they feel just as big as if they could squash us, you know, so easily. So I, I, I highly recommend in terms of learning how to, to set boundaries, there's no perfect guide that says set it here or there, but get a support system who you can bounce it off of. Or like when, when I was setting the boundaries with my mother, I was in a men's group and I had a therapist uh, who I could bounce that off of. I said, am I being unreasonable? Am I being an ass? You know, should, should, is, could, could I do this differently? And the support I kept getting was, no, you're, you're doing that actually very well. Continue. This, this is a healthy thing to do. Um, so is that, and that was, that was in the context of male space. That was like a male only environment. Where actually, you were able my therapist was a female. So it was actually okay. a, a woman who was giving me the feedback and I was in a men's group as well. Okay. You, you mentioned something earlier. You said something like boundary setting and boundary enforcement is like 
getting us to be different more so than getting other could you expand on that a little bit more i've never heard of that before that sounds fascinating well yeah if you think about it trying to get somebody else to be different is fundamentally manipulative it's like saying you should change because i don't like you how you are (laughs) i don't i don't like how you act around me now you know in, in every relationship we do need to give people that feedback like the you know ouch that hurt or hey you're standing on my foot or hey, you know, I'd, I'd like you to kiss me more, or I'd, I'd like you, you know, not to make that face when I make dinner. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, we can ask for what we want. That, that, that's, that's great. But trying to get someone else to be different so that we don't have to feel uncomfortable is, is, is controlling, is manipulative. And it's much better to, to, to tell our partner, say, hey, I'd be much happier if X, Y, Z, you know, if you could do it this way, if you could stop doing that, if you could ask me differently. But when it's all said and done, if, if they can't, if they're not willing to, not able to, we have to decide, can we live with it? And if we can, we say, hey, I love everything else about them. This thing kind of irritates me but I'm not gonna leave them over that. We don't get to complain about it anymore. We don't get to keep trying to change them. We don't let, let, get to let ourselves get wound up about it. But if we can't live with it, we need to remove ourselves and we need to do it with love. I, I dated a, a woman for a, little, for a few years and when we finally moved in together, I quickly found out I could not live with her. And, and one reason was she couldn't just ask me, hey, would you mind you know, like unloading the dishwasher when you get home? You know, she'd get home from work and she'd scream at me for not having unloaded the dishwasher. And I just say, hey, you know, I'm not your kid. I'm not your brother. You know, I pay the rent. I'm 58. No one gets to yell at me, you know, where I pay the rent. And I said, if you want me to unload the dishwasher when, you know, just send me a text message from work. Hey, would you mind? I said, I love unloading the dishwasher. Just ask. And no matter how many times I asked her, hey, just ask rather than, you know, go off on me. If I didn't read your mind and do something you wanted, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't stop doing that. It was so ingrained in her nervous system. I even said, please go to therapy. I'll pay for it. Learn to manage your anxiety responses so you don't snap at me and yell at me. And she said, nobody gets to tell me what to do. And I'll go, okay, goodbye. And I broke up with her because, you know, I couldn't live with it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I coached her, uh, please just ask. And she couldn't change it. So I had to leave cause I couldn't live with it. So again, we've got to be that decider. Can, can I, is this something I can live with or is it something I can't? And we're adults. We get to decide that. And, and again, when we first start setting boundaries, it can be a real challenge to do that. And I've, I've often said, when people first start learning about boundaries, they become what I call kamikaze boundary setters. You know, maybe just a fly swatter would get the job done, but they pull out a chainsaw, you know, and go after it. But that just, that that takes practice. And the best boundaries usually have finesse to them. They're they're usually not a chainsaw approach. But again, that just takes time because again, most of us did not learn how to do this as kids. I, I like how you I like how you uh, shared your experience there involving this particular woman and kind of walked through your entire process of you know progression because you showed uh, the audience for example and like three times the amount of people that we started with just joined so by the way guys this is Dr Robert Glover author of No More Mr Nice Guy and Dating Tips for Men and uh, definitely. A gentleman who has saved my life, and he's uh, live with us from uh, Mexico, which is awesome. And uh, uh, one of my uh, greatest mentors and our men's group uh, within the CSJ community is actually based largely upon his work. At least initially, it definitely was, and it is part of our required reading uh, for the men who are involved. Uh, that being said, um, when you when you when you walk through that entire process about being in a relationship with a woman and the dishwasher uh, scene there, it was interesting how you didn't like immediately react and you know like throw up like the walls or 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 completely detach right off the bat, and that you gave her opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity with even additional support. And then that way, and it proves that because you took that concrete action, you did actually love this woman. But then if you had situations, maybe when you were a lot younger, that were similar to that, wouldn't you not have also dealt with uh, people in your life who would have judged you for potentially 
ending that relationship, even oh, though oh, you sure, were. of course. Yeah. yeah I, I was in a 14 year marriage where um, that's when I wrote No More Mr. Nice Guy, where, where yeah, my boundaries were constantly accosted. Um, and towards the end of that marriage, I had a dream. And I don't know where the dream came from. You're Jungian, so you, you probably yeah. have heard with this. It, it was just like a volcano, volcano erupting inside of me. And, and I think the context was um, my wife was treating me badly in some way. And this volcano erupted and out of me came, what the fuck makes you think you can treat me that way? And I woke up. And, and in that moment, I vowed to myself, I'll never let anyone treat me bad again. Now, it took a little time Preach before I, I finally got to where I lived that, not just vowed it. And, you know, it took a couple more years in that marriage of, of being treated badly to say it's not going to continue. And, and I've continued with that mantra. Now, do, do I slip into some old patterns? Yeah, I do. But I, I, I tend to wake up to them pretty quickly. Um, so... I did not handle that well. And there's been other situations where I've not handled boundary violations near as well. You know, sometimes you get triggered in ways that bring up your own, own childhood trauma and your own childhood survival mechanisms. But again, if we know we can remove ourselves, if we can be equally okay with whatever outcome comes, um, if, if we truly are loving ourselves enough to invite the other per person into higher consciousness. Um, we really can evolve together. We can help each other. And I've often said that conscious relationships are, are a powerful personal growth machine. And um, later on, that person I broke up with got in touch with me and said, you know what? Thank you. I went and got into therapy and uh, it's helped me manage my anxiety reactions. You know, so she thanked me for it. Um, and again, I'll just keep putting it, putting that out there. It's our job to set the boundaries for our life. It's our job to invite people to higher consciousness. It's our job to remove ourselves if we cannot tolerate the behavior. And, and again, we, you know, we can coach the other person to say, hey, don't, don't do it this way. Please do it this way. I'll respond better if you do it this way. And they'll either, you know, again, some people are not willing to make the change. Some people's nervous systems don't allow them to make the change. And, and I've encountered that with, with friends, family, and, and clients that for whatever reason, their nervous system cannot do it differently. And, um, and you, you can lovingly move on from those people if you can't live with whatever their nervous system keeps coming up with. And that's usually in boundary issues, what we're most often dealing with is people's uh, fight, flight, freeze mechanisms that are deeply wired into their, their emotional operating system from infancy on. So some people just can't, um, but some people don't want to. Um, it's an interesting point, because when you're talking about uh, inviting people to higher consciousness, I will admit I have a huge problem doing that. I, I see the value in it. I feel really good about that. People need to know that that's important. And it's definitely important to me. And that's something that I want to be doing in the future, uh, especially in the context of my own relationships and not just like relationships with my wife or my children or people close to me, but just people that I talk to on a regular basis. My issue is, is that oftentimes I have a bad habit of, making statements like judgmental statements about sure. people instead of asking them questions about it. Well, what do you think of this? Or how do you feel about this? Or is the, is the, is the developing the habit of asking questions instead of making statements, is that what is required to help invite those people into that higher consciousness in that moment in terms of developing the habit to be able to do that? Possibly. I'm actually not a big question asker. Um, and I'm, I'm judgmental as hell. And, and I think maybe most of us are, if we actually just get honest with ourselves, most of us are pretty critical, judgmental uh, of ourselves and of other people. Here's what's helped me the most in, in having a more open-minded perspective, perspective towards people is, is to not let myself spin up a story that I now create as truth and belief system. Well, that person's doing this because now I spin a story up or I don't let myself get into a victim place 
where now I'm, I'm building a case for that great referee in the sky to come call a penalty on them and, you know, put them in the penalty box. If my mind gets wound up about something, I'm not going to respond to it in a very loving way. I'm going to respond to it in a reactionary, reactionary way. So that has helped me as much as anything. If I notice myself creating a story, in fact, I send myself a daily, I send myself several daily reminders. One of them just says, no story. Whenever we make a story up, we are projecting our, our story. We're projecting us onto another person. And now we're defining their behavior by our story. So for example, um, my wife, you know, uh, I'm, I'm married and, you know, everybody has their triggers and their own behaviors and love my wife dearly. I just took a five day road trip with her and we got along beautifully. We don't even speak the same first language and, and we still had a great time. Um, and so when I get caught up in story, like she shouldn't accuse me of that, blah, 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 blah. Um, I have reactions to it. But if I can eliminate the story and just break it down to the basics, and if my wife is doing what one of her behaviors that I find irritating, like accusing me of looking at a woman's butt, for example, and I don't even know what woman she's talking about, but she saw a woman's butt, so she assumed I must have looked at it. And if I looked at it, I must want to be with that woman, which means she's worthless. You know, I, that, that's my own interpretation, but she, I think, is validated. That's kind of the whole how you connect the dots of it. But that's her trauma. That's her old stuff. But if I get spun up about it, I'm going to have a reaction to it. But if I can just keep it simple, like, oh, my wife is not feeling sufficiently loved, or my wife is feeling afraid, or my wife is not feeling connected. Those are maybe some things I can actually help with. And I can actually show up in a way that my wife might feel more loved, or she might feel more connected, or might feel less afraid. I don't have to fix anything. But by not having a story, and, and, and because I get to practice this in my marriage with my wife, it's helped me practice it with other people out there in the world. You know, it's easy to say, oh, that person's such an asshole. They're this, yeah. Well, okay, what might a safer story be? Maybe they are afraid. Maybe they're in their own flight, flight, freeze mechanism. Uh, maybe they don't know how to deal with the world in a different way. And I'm not saying you tolerate bad behavior, but, but not having a story about it, I think helps invite the other person into higher consciousness. So, you know, it gives you a, a, a less reactive, to, you know, attacking, uh, judgmental uh, platform to do that. So I'd say just be the observer of that. What stories do you spin up in your head about what, why other people are doing what they do or who they are? I, I do it all the time, uh, especially with my extroverted intuition from a Jungian standpoint, I'm always aware of all of the potential possibilities, potential opportunities, potential whys as to something is happening. And I'll admit that oftentimes my mind goes to the absolute worst one and then starts making decisions based on that and judgments go. based on that when it's not even remotely uh, a thing. And I, although I have noticed one thing though, well, I can spin up stories about other people's intentions, and I think I'll have a similar habit on my phone pretty soon, uh, is that you mentioned something about a victim place. And that is extremely common for people like me, as well as uh, Mr. Cayman Talcott, who happens to be in the live stream chat as well. Uh, sorry, came in. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> but uh, You just but the, victimized him right there. I know. <laughs> But the thing is, is that we have a tendency of putting ourselves in a victim mindset. It's mm -hmm. extremely common and it's, and I'll admit it's really common even for myself. How, how do you develop healthy habits to get around creating those stories where you're putting yourself in a victim mindset by default? Yeah. And, and not, and making those assumptions about other people's actions, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, if you think about it, all of this makes sense. All, all of this, all the stuff we're talking about it is to some degree is adaptive behavior. Um, you know, if we were small and vulnerable and people could do stuff to us, it made sense to be, you know, constantly looking, you know, checking for landmines. What, what might I be stepping on at any given moment? That makes sense to do that. Um, if, if you have not felt safe around people for much of your life, it, it makes sense to, to not trust people. Um, 
And again, a lot of this has to do both with, you know, our, our natural temperament, but the things we experienced. And again, my, my, my present wife, Lupita, is a good example of, of the differences. She grew up in, in Guadalajara, Mexico, eight out of 10 kids uh, in poverty, alcoholic father who pretty much only came around to have sex with her mother, um, you know, did not have a pair of shoes to wear to school till she quit school at 15 and got a job to buy herself shoes. She had to wear flip-flops to school. Her older sister beat her regularly. Neighbors beat her. She was molested at 12. She's had, you know, in, in Mexican culture, you know, stealing is a way of life. And I'm not trying to make a generalization about all Mexicans, but it is part of, of a culture dynamic. And the people people are most likely to steal from is their own family members, right? People they love, that's who you steal from because that's where you have the easiest access. Um, so she grew up with that. I grew up in, you know, white bread, suburban Seattle, Washington with a bunch Me of too. Boeing, Boeing engineers families, you know, it's just very white bread, you know, college educated, and, and it's just kind of like, it was a whole I different lived in Linwood. <laughs> lived in Linwood. I grew up in Bellevue. So yeah, we, we, <laughs> we were pretty close neighbors. Grew up in Lake Hills, went to Sammamish High School. Um, oh, yeah. Very, very white bread, suburban. You know, my family was probably upper, lower class, but I was in a middle class community. Um, you know, everybody's expected to go to college, blah, blah, blah. So my wife and I have this very different worldview. She assumes everybody's out to fuck her over. Um, uh, chingar is a Spanish word to fuck somebody. Yeah, you know, they, they're, they're gonna fuck me over. My worldview is if somebody does something stupid, they're probably just unconscious and not really thinking about it, right? And so, we've had I've learned not to have debates with her about why is that person driving that way, you know, why, why is that person acting that way? You know, she has a worldview that says, well, they're out to fuck us over, you know. Uh, my worldview is they're probably just not very conscious. Um, but here's the, here's the good news. I've learned from her. I've learned how to be more conscious of where the landmines are and where the potential pitfalls are and where I do need to have my guard up when appropriate. She's also learned to be less um, quick to judge other people as that they're out to get her. And, and we've been good for each other in that way. We both had something to learn. So, the, but this core piece of going back to about being a victim, that, that, that serves a purpose in some context, in some points of life. Now, I actually think also one of the reasons why being a victim is so attractive, I think from an evolutionary point of view, when people were victimized, if they were attacked by an animal, if they got hurt, if they got stabbed in a battle, they got extra attention. They got empathy. They got people noticing them. They got an extra supply of goodies. They got a day off from work. Being a victim had, had, had positive side effects to it. So I think that's part of our human DNA. But unfortunately, everybody gets tired of a victim after a while. You know, after a while, yeah, we know you got gored by that wild boar. We're tired of the story. Get off your ass and get to work. People get tired. We even get tired of our own, you know, pity parties. So there, there is, I think, some adaptive purpose to being a victim. Now, being conscious lets us look at, and there's a difference between being a victim and, and feeling victimized. We may indeed have been a victim in a certain context, but that doesn't mean we have to identify with that, that I am a victim or take on a, a victimization mindset. I've worked with a lot of people in therapy who had genuine trauma in childhood, but they're so identified with their trauma, they carry that victim mentality throughout life. Everything is traumatic to them. I've worked with other people that have had severe trauma and they were able to just work through it. It was something that happened to them that was, that was bad, that was painful, but they don't identify with it. And, and yeah. it's just something in their past that happened and they move on. So to answer your question, we have to learn to be the observers of ourselves. Are we identifying and getting some kind of psychic mileage out of feeling victimized? Is it becoming us? They treated me so bad. They're so, and so therefore I, I, I'm deserving of something extra. I'm, you know, or, or do we just say, Hey man, that hurt. I've, I've got to, you know, I either got to talk to them about them, this, or I got to remove myself, or I need to try to get an understanding of why they're behaving that way. Again, depending on the context, you're going to respond one way with your wife than, than, than you would with a stranger on the street. Um, but, but not, 
letting yourself wallow in that victim stuff. Okay, it does feel good. There is a certain, I don't know, there's a dopamine hit to it, but there's a good feel to feeling victimized. Um, but it keeps us so stuck and so trapped. And it also means we got to keep finding people to victimize us. And, you know, th that's not a very adaptive way, way to live. So watch the stories and watch the emotional payoff you're getting by feeling victimized by somebody. Emotional payoff. I, I, I guess that's, I guess that's a, another aspect of that habit I, I was talking about earlier is like, you know, if people are getting more out of it than I am, et cetera. But then again, I have to also keep track of potential emotional payoffs in that same habit because I might be actually putting, setting myself up for failure in that moment. And, and you might be a biased scorekeeper as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. There's a chance of that, you know. So, but let me add another piece to that because you, you mentioned that before. One of the things I had to learn, and I'm working with a lot of men over the years, is a lot of times we nice guys are not good receivers. And so we actually, we, we do a couple of things. We either get with people that are not very good givers, and you know, they're broken in some way, and we do all our time giving to them, hoping we'll polish them up and we'll have this, you know, diamond in the rough. Um, but they never do. Uh, broken people don't polish up. Uh, especially when you have an agenda of polishing a broken person so that they'll love you and be complete. That's not a good life strategy. Um, but the other part is, is we, we are often terrible receivers. Every woman I've ever been with has told me how difficult it is for them to give to me because, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of needless and wantless. And, you know, I asked my granddaughter when I saw her a couple of weeks ago, I said, what do you want for your birthday? She's going to be 14 uh, in October. And she goes, oh, I don't really need anything. And I said, you sound exactly like me. You're just like your grandfather. That's what my answer is when everybody says, what do you want for your birthday? I don't really need anything, you know? Um, but even beyond, do I need material stuff as birthday gifts? I do need lots of things in life. And, but if I'm not a good receiver, I'm going to build these systems with people and institutions where I do a lot of giving for whatever reason, either through validation or hoping for future return. But if I'm not a good receiver, I don't let them give back. And then my scorekeeping kicks in and says, oh, I seem to be giving all the time and nobody ever seems to give as much. I had to go to work. That's been a major part of my personal nice guy recovery is letting people give to me, both asking and letting them give to me. This morning, my wife was leaving to go to a, a physical therapy thing for her knee. And um, she'd been a little bit emotional when she left. And I, I, I just said, no, talk to me before you go. And, um, and I kind of held her and she cried a little bit and then she was better. And, um, and so I, I, we've got this puppy, uh, this four month old pit bulls lying at my feet right now. And, you know, the puppy is going to want to go outside with her. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm opening the door to take the puppy out, but keep an eye on her while she goes to get in the car. And she says, she goes to the refrigerator to get herself a little cup of jello to take with her. Cause she hadn't eaten breakfast before she went to therapy. And she said, would you like a jello? Now in that moment, I really had no need for a jello. I, I was just, you know, holding the dog while she could go out without the dog running off. And, um, but because I have practiced letting people give to me, and that was her way of saying, thank you for listening to me and holding me before I left this morning. I said, yeah, sure. I'd love a Jell-O. And um, I almost forgot about the Jell-O. I left it on the countertop, came back an hour later and thought, I'm going to switch that one in the fridge for one that's still <laughs> I know, right? But I thought, I better eat it before she gets home. Um, but I, that, that was a conscious decision to say, yes, I would like a jello. I had no desire for a jello in that moment. And I'm not saying, you know, we should fake a lot of stuff. But, but I've learned that everybody has their own way of giving back. And if we don't let them, we are going to have these one-sided relationships where it feels like, well, I give, I give, I give. I don't. So I gave a hug and, and empathy and listened for 90 seconds. And I got a jello in return. And, you know, you know, I don't know how that fits on the scoreboard, but, you know, it's, it's a good way to look at it. Let people give to us. And, and then I tell nice guys all the time, I said, it makes you feel good to give to people. And I said, but when you're needless and wantless, you're robbing other people of the joy of giving to you. Don't do that. That's not loving. Let people give to you. So it's, it's a skill worth practicing. It, it I agree with you. It's, it was a painful skill for me. I, I'm not really that great at it. This is an area I need to 
I need to humble myself about. Like, for example, um, I've been married for about about like a, a year and a half now. And when when I first met my wife, our very first date was she decided that she wanted to take me to the mall. I was like, okay. So she we go into the mall. And this is after I came off of a really rough uh, breakup with like two different women previously. And both of them... Don't break up with two women it, at the same time. Not a good idea. Yeah, it, it was it was rough. And uh, <laughs> in, in any case, um, well, the first one, the first one tried to scam me basically, and it, and it goes into like stealing from loved ones type of uh, yeah, you yeah. know thing that you said, and that and it's kind of part of her cultural background, you know. And and the other one, uh, it was more of maybe a a perspective of entitlement, but I really don't know enough about what that situation was to really say. So I'm not going to make offer any real specific judgments on that, but it's interesting because I had those, those two breakups where I was giving so much sure. to them the yeah. whole time. And then I caught myself covert contracting at, while I was doing it because I felt entitled you know, yeah. afterwards. And I'm like, okay, this is not sustainable. This is not a really good relationship. And then, you know, I, I, I met my wife and she, on the very first date and, oh my gosh, it, it was a moment where I had like the worst pride in the world. She brought, she took me to the Oakley store and she bought me a very expensive pair of glasses on our first date. And I had to swallow my pride so hard just to accept that from her. It was a very painful experience for myself. I hear you. <laughs> but I still have them. I love them. I wear them all the time. They're my babies. And Which makes your wife feel good. That they yes. she gave you something. I'll, I'll tell you a story. Just to even, even this. The woman I told you that I broke up with her because she couldn't just asked me to unload the dishwasher, uh, a, a positive story about her. One of the reasons why I did date her for a few years. Um, when I started dating her, she worked at the mall and she worked uh, at Nordstrom and then later J. Crew and in retail clothing sales. So she's good at folding clothes, right? In, in, in the mall, in the, in the store. So like, I don't know, we, we'd been dating. I don't know. I don't know how many dates, not very long. And um, she came over to my apartment and we were going to go somewhere and I'd done some laundry and I just had laid it out on, on a couch in my apartment. And I was going to fold it later, but I laid it out so it wouldn't be all wrinkled after I took it out of the dryer. And she just walked into my apartment without saying a word, just started folding my clothes and stacking them on my bed. And I said, wait, 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 I don't want you to fold my clothes. And she goes, actually, I like folding clothes. I'm good at it. And I go, uh, okay, but I, I don't want you to like come over to my apartment and start folding my clothes. And she goes, I like doing it. And I, I had to catch myself like you and the Oakleys. And I thought, okay, this is me practicing letting somebody give to me and letting her love me in a way that she expressed her love. And so I thought this is good, good therapy and good practice for me. And she said, but I won't put your clothes away. I'll fold them for you. I said, I don't want you to put them away. I'm going to leave them on the bed the rest of the week to remind me that somebody loves me and somebody did something nice for me. So as we continued to date, I just started leaving my clothes on the couch whenever uh, she was going to come over and she would come over and fold them. And I did it purely to practice receiving and letting her give to me. So, and again, this can't, as you know, this can be really challenging to let people give, but if we don't, that's all we're going to have are these one-sided relationships with covert contracts that we're giving to get, and we're not letting them give anything back to us. So we've got to let them give, and it, for many of us, it takes practice. Yeah, I, I just now texted my wife because she you made say, me- thank you for the Oakleys. <laughs> I said, thank you for the eggs that she made me this morning because she added a little bit extra to it. And I was like, eh, I'm not comfortable with that. And I, I reacted negatively to her and I, I felt bad. I was like, yeah, I should actually thank her for putting in the effort because the extra effort that she put into that to, to cooking breakfast for me, uh, it was her showing her love to me and I needed it was. to be accepting of that. Yeah, It was so, her so showing just, her it, love. Good yeah. for you, you're a good man. <laughs> I, I love her dearly. I just, I'm always looking for additional ways to uh you know meet that halfway because i mean sometimes i just get so stuck in my own comfort zone it's really hard for me to like realize what other people are actually doing 
because I'm all about, oh, what everyone intends to do all the time. But yeah. seeing other people's actions, you know, because I expect people to separate attentions and actions all the time around me, but then I'm not even paying attention oftentimes to their actions towards me. And it's like, oh, well, and then I come off like someone who's like super depraved. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, that also gives you a clue to what her love language is that she did an act of service for you. And that was her way of saying, I love you. I, I value you. Now we don't all give and receive by the same love language, but often we do, but not always. So, you know, she did an act of service for you. And that was her way of saying, I love you, which gives you a clue of what probably makes her feel loved as well. Um, and so acts of service may make her feel loved as well. But again, that's not 100% accurate, but it's a good thing to pay attention to. But yes, especially sir. pay attention, because like my, my wife, again, had to educate me. She said, you know, you provide everything. You know, I do. I, I pay all the bills. She takes care of everything. And she's the most competent human being I know. You know, just stuff gets done. And um, she says, let me do things for you. Let, let me give you a pedicure. Let me clip your fingernails for you. Let me do yeah, things for you. Yeah, I'm going to clip my fingernails yesterday. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Because it's still she, here on the desk. There you go. <laughs> she said, she said you, you, you take care of everything. I, can, shit, I can't you know, I, I, I can make in 30 minutes what she would take a week to make down here in Mexico. And so she said, let me love you. And so that's been a concerted practice to let her. So when she says, do you want a jello? Or when I'm taking the garbage out front and I got to open the front gate and go put some garbage out, she says, do you need help? I don't need help taking the garbage out. I really don't. But I learned a long time ago. We we're coming up on four years married. I learned a long time ago when she says, do you need help? I say, yeah, come on. Let's take the garbage out together. That's her way of loving me. And I have to practice receiving that or I'm going to feel unloved and she's going to quit trying. She goes, well, why should I do that if he doesn't care? Yeah, yeah, that's so right. I mean, my wife even did that earlier today. We came back from the gym. And then she's like, do you need help getting the mail? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no. I don't need help getting the mail. I've been getting the mail <laughs> since I was 12. I think I can. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Let's go get the mail. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> yeah, that's love. That's your love on her part. That's love on your part. That's love. We, we don't have to make this any more complicated than that. Yeah, well, it, I, I really appreciate this very much because you've kind of opened my mind to a completely different dynamic to my own marriage. And I think my marriage is very similar to yours as, you, as you're describing uh, uh, your wife uh, during this talk. And it's like, okay, yeah, that, that's, that's very fair. Uh, and I think, I think that will help her have even more recognition uh, because sometimes I feel like my wife sometimes is uh, starved for recognition and, and, uh, you know, she, she wants me to react positively to the things that she does. And because and if I don't react, then like I I'm either like she may take it and I'm not trying to create a story here, but she may take it like uh, how, you know, maybe I'm being selfish or maybe I'm being depraved or maybe I don't care, or, you know, those things. And, and those are or, all or even a bigger one want. for a lot of women. I've, I've heard them say, you don't need me. You know, a lot of us oh, men yeah. are pretty self-sufficient. You know, I, I am, I, I can get pretty much anything done. I need to get done. And I've had a number of women say, I don't feel like you need me. And, and that seems to be an important piece. So yeah, me saying, yeah, give me a jello or yeah, come help me, you know, take the garbage out. You know, I mentioned the road trip I took with my wife here in Mexico, they pump your gas in the gas station, wipe your windshields and put air in your tires like they used to in America. And um, so we get like in Kansas partway in our trip and she watched me pump gas one time. And the second time we went to pump stop for gas, she said, will you teach me how to pump gas? I've never done it in my life and I want to know how to do it. And I said, sure. And then she pumped our gas every single time we stopped for gas because she wanted to learn and I realized it was important to her. And she, and she also washed our windows with the squeegee every time. And you know, that's stuff I think, you know, I think that's guy stuff. I got to be up there washing the window. She wanted to do it. It was her way of showing her love. And so I showed her how to pump gas correctly and how to, you know, the handle, how to make sure you, you know, put the lid back on the gas cap, gas cap on and close the little gas cap door. And, um, 
And again, she's the most competent person I know, but is it just a life skill she didn't have? And, and by doing it is her way of saying, I'm contributing to the road trip. Yeah, I, I, that's fantastic. I, my wife uh, did that. Like she'll, so when she first came in uh, to my life, it's so funny. Like uh, she came over to my home one day and I was live doing my show one time. And it was the first time she came over, opened the door. Hi, how you doing? I have a show. And I go in my studio doing a show and I'm, I, and it's two hours long. Didn't even see her. She didn't even come into the studio or nothing. And, and we weren't even officially together yet. I come out of, of the studio. The whole house is completely clean. All the <laughs> shoes lined up. All the, the laundry's going. Food is made and everything. And I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> acts of service. Your yes. wife's love language is acts of service. <laughs> I, I was like, whoa. Yeah, I, she, she is consistently given to me. And, and I do appreciate it. I, I guess I need to humble myself and uh, show more appreciation for that. Uh, and, uh, and, and it is true, like in my entire life, no one really has treated me better than her. Um, you know, yeah, every now and then we'll have a conflict and whatnot. But at the end of the day, like I still love my wife dearly. And mm -hmm. it, it's so interesting to just kind of see, like, you know, from your point of view, like, you know, don't spin a story, don't make yourself a victim and remind yourself to accept help from other people. I guess, I guess I really, I guess that's a really big deal. So based on that, my question then is, is that given that it seems like a lot of those hangups may actually come from personal pride, how do we as men allow ourselves to, or tackle personal pride in such a way where we're not allowing other people to, you know, break our boundaries and we're enforcing our boundaries. We have proper personal standards. We're taking responsibility for meeting our own needs and those types of things, but we don't do it in such a way where we allow our pride to get in the way and cause this negativity with our loved ones, especially, you know, our wives or girlfriends, significant others, et cetera. Well, you know, you, you used the term a few times and what we're talking about, it's about you had to humble yourself and, um, my, just, you know, just, I'm thinking out loud about this, you know, you know, you, you had to make a conscious decision to humble yourself. As I said earlier, a lot of nice guys, a lot of men I work with do have a hard time receiving and, and we might have different emotional stories to go with that. One might be everybody else's needs are more important than mine, or I have to wait till everybody else's needs are met before mine can get met. Or if I let somebody do something for me, I owe them now. They'll have something on me. I'm in emotional debt to them. Or even a lot of the guys I work with feel like they are bad. They're doing something wrong and they're going to be in trouble if somebody does something for them. So there's a lot of uh, negative emotional baggage and, and everybody's got a little different piece woven into that. So sometimes you just kind of have to watch your internal workings around that. You know, when, when somebody, when, when you've developed this sense of, as, as I have as well, kind of this, um, I don't know what's a good word for it. Uh, where I, I can I can get it all done myself, you know I can do it myself. Um, when you've developed that view of life, there's probably a reason for that, and that is we never learned to trust anybody, or maybe people did not value what our needs, and maybe we learned that you know if if they if if our needs were met, you know we we paid a price. So this is you know part of our own personal recovery and and, and personal process. You use the word humble yourself. Um, what it may be is that you're making yourself vulnerable that when somebody when you let somebody do something for you you feel vulnerable and that and that you know back in your emotional operating system something here could something bad could could come from this something could go south in a hurry if you let somebody do something for you now again you know your own story is woven in there and you might not even have words for it it might just be an emotional state you feel in your body and it may be that again uh, you feel like, you know, you're going to get hurt or you're going to get in trouble. Or you're going to owe somebody or you're not going to figure out what they wanted back. It was, a, you know, maybe you were used to dealing with people's covert contracts and you're going to get it wrong and you won't respond right. Then you'll get hurt. So it could be any number of things. But I, I think the, the, the key piece is, is you being willing to feel vulnerable and, and, and maybe also just being conscious enough 
of of other people of of how they're different than you like you know we're talking about our wives and some other people that have given to us the acts of service was their love language and um if we don't know that you know we're going to come off kind of an ass no don't do my laundry. Yeah. No, i don't need a jello no i don't need help getting the mail um so maybe we'll treat this both as you being willing to be vulnerable and you be willing to let somebody love you to, to really let them in because when when I said yes to the jello, I was letting my wife love me. I mean, what, what, what greater act of love is there than to let somebody love you? Um, I mean, think about how bad it feels when, you know, you try to love somebody and they push it away. It's really interesting you say that. Cause I think Benjamin Franklin also said something similarly cause he wrote a treatise on, uh, favors among neighbors. And he's like, Hey, if you ask, a if you ask your neighbor for a favor, they're more likely to give to do you a favor later because it's actually you're choosing to use your personal power to show vulnerability temporarily to your neighbor, which makes them feel important or makes them even feel valued in some cases. So they're more inclined to help you later when you actually need yeah. help. And I'm like, wait a minute. When I first read that, I'm like, that sounds really selfish. When I was like, yeah. really, when I was 17, when I first read that. And nowadays I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> well, it does. And I'd, I'd come across that same thing. And I, I think he even took it further is that he said they're more likely to convince themselves they like you and that you're a good person. Oh, yeah. If, okay. if they've done something good for you. And there's a psychological dynamic to that of, of emotional um uh, uh, constancy, you know, we don't like emotional dissonance. So if we, if we, if somebody says, can you do this for me? And we do it, our brain has to develop a belief system. I like them. That's why I'm willing to do this for them. Right. But if our, if we do it for them and, and we think that guy's an asshole for asking, but I'm giving it to it anyway, that creates a dissonance inside of us that makes us uncomfortable. So psychologically, yeah, it's kind of like when I work with nice guys. I said, hey, you know, you go out and you, you want this woman to like you. So you like give her gifts and you do things for her and you do all this kind of stuff. It, it actually has the opposite effect. If you actually ask the woman to do something for you, you actually increase the likelihood that she will like you and think better of you. And it, again, it, it doesn't make sense for our brains that are used to giving to get. Um, but, but I think there's a psychological truth to it. It's like uh, it's like uh, the law of reverse reciprocity, uh, which I think is really fantastic. I think uh, I think for my audience, uh, reciprocity kind of seems like okay from an expert sensing to an introverted sensing standpoint, or uh, expert intuition to introverted intuition standpoint, or expert feeling to introverted feeling, et cetera. All these different cognitive senses that they're used to talking about, but then reversing that entirely. Uh, you know, giving to get the whole covert contract standpoint where it's more of like getting to a level of acceptance where, you know, humbling yourself enough to actually ask for assistance will render you more assistance later. I, I, I think this helps people understand like how expert feeling on expert feeling relationships work. People who are all about putting their heart out there for other people and doing those acts of service and people who are helping and focus on that. Uh, whereas, you you know, most usually we say on paper relationships, you have you have the one that's helping and do it, being the helper and being outward. And you have the one that's inward where they're like, OK, I'm going to help me. Oh, thank you for helping me. And then and it kind of keeps an equilibrium there mm -hmm. from that one way street. But then when you're in that two way street, we have two helpers at the same time. I guess, I guess that makes a lot more sense. And you have to kind of take on that role of the person inward who would show gratitude. And that's probably one of the biggest struggles I've had in my life is showing gratitude or knowing how to show gratitude. Right. Because sometimes it wouldn't even occur to me. And then I ended up getting a relationship, even amongst my own immediate family growing up, for being someone who's selfish and depraved, but it didn't even occur to me. And I actually, I had to learn the habit of yeah. showing gratitude afterwards. I, I, it had to be a learned behavior. I, I did too. It's, it was a learned behavior. I didn't start learning it till I was in my late forties. And I, I was going Dang. through my, going through my second divorce. Actually, I, I learned a lot of this shit pretty late in life. Um, there was yeah, not a, a there was not a no more Mr. Nice Guy book for me to read, you know, in my twenties. Um, 
But when I, I was actually going through my second divorce, we'd split. And I was going to, uh, I started going to a 12 step group again to, to, I was treating my second wife as, as my drug that, that we had a trauma bonded relationship. And I just needed support to get out of that relationship. And, um, and, and in 12 step programs, they have, you know, a lot of platitudes. And, and one of them that stuck with me was having an attitude of gratitude. Um, and so I, I was actually writing, um, an online class. My book was about to come out, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And Barnes and Noble, who was publishing it, asked me to write uh, a spinoff class that I could teach on their online university. And so it had eight lessons that was written directed towards nice guy principles and work and career. And I, I wanted to write a chapter about abundance thinking. And it was like the hardest chapter I'd ever written in my life. And I'm, I, I never get writer's block. I, I mean, I, did, I never have enough time to write everything I want to write. Um, but I, could, I couldn't write it. And I realized I was emotionally blocked around uh, abundance thinking. And I thought, well, maybe because I have a deprivation view of the world. That's how I was raised. There's, I grew up in a fundamental Christian church. My, my parents grew Me up too. in the Great Depression. You know, there's, you know, rich people are unhappy and going oh, to hell. <laughs> there's never, you know, there's not enough to go around. You know, if, if, if somebody else has something that's less for everybody else, it's just, you know, just real deprivation thinking. If you do have something, it's going to get taken away from you. It's going to go away. If it breaks, you can never fix it again. I mean, that was my worldview. And so I started a daily gratitude practice with a friend I'd met in this 12 step program. And I said, Hey, let's before, before we get up in the morning, before we go to bed at night, you know, you think of things you feel grateful for. I'll think of things and we'll talk about it each day. We'll check in with each other. And within days, I started noticing a difference in my view of the world and my view of myself. And that chapter started to write itself. And so I, to, to this day, that was 20 years ago. Um, I still practice gratitude. Uh, I do it on a regular basis. First thing in the morning, I wake up and I, I offer gratitude for a restful night's sleep, for being alive, for air conditioning, for 600 thread count Pima cotton sheets and a nice mattress and the woman next to me. And, and I just start offering gratitude from the time I wake up. And um, it's changed my life. It's been one of the most powerful practices I've, I've ever done in my life was, was learning to be grateful. And what, what, one of the things I learned is that abundance is not a matter of how much stuff you got. It's an awareness of how blessed you are. So if you're not aware of how blessed you are, it doesn't do any good if your stuff gets multiplied by a hundred, a thousand or a million. It's all a matter of awareness. Cause I mean, again, I live down here in Mexico and you know, just some of the poorest people are much more happy than the people up in Bellevue, Washington, that, you know, where Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos live and a lot of Amazon and Microsoft millionaires live. You know, they're driving nice cars, living in expensive apartments. They don't look fucking happy. And I see these people down here in Mexico with nothing and they're happy. You know, they, they know how to sing and have a party and drink a little cerveza and some tequila. And that's that. so true. Oh, they, they, so true. They know how to, to enjoy what they have. And like my wife says, you know, when she was a poor single mom, she'd get together with other poor single moms and they would share what they had with each other and have a little, you know, mom's meal together. You know, that none of them had much, but they'd share what they had. Now that's, that's abundance, that's gratitude. And that makes all the difference in how we perceive ourselves and perceive the world. Oh yeah. I, Thank you for sharing that because I, I, I completely agree. And it, it just shows or exposes myself to myself that I need to definitely do even more work in that area. I, I've been trying to do that a lot with my parents recently because I reconnected to my parents. I've not speaking to them for a while and trying to get that there. And I am even seeing how I probably definitely did do more work uh, in that area, at least towards my sister as well. Um, so I only have one sibling. And her and I sibling rivalry pretty hard oh, okay. for so long because uh, she's she's very similar to me, but but not quite. Um, she's like a mega mega caring version of me, and I'm a mega mega brainy version of her. So <laughs> it ends up becoming like we're just as you said earlier, a lot of projection, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah. trying not to uh, do that. We're actually uh, coming up on the end of the show. We only got. Uh, four minutes left here. Um, so, uh, what's, what's next for you, Dr. Glover? Uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, 
what's in the what's in the cards these days? Uh, you had uh, dating tips for men, which is your second book. You got a third book coming, or any yeah, big work, project you're working on? Working on that. Um, I've, I've got a whiteboard over here that says ten books in ten years. I, I made a commitment in the men's program I'm in two years ago. Um, you know, I, I may make it. I, I got 10 books in me that I want to write. So um, I, I see my life continuing to evolve where I'm, 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 I'm converting most of the things that like the classes I teach and stuff like that into product and, and just wanting to turn a lot of it into books. And so, um, you know, uh, I had a near death experience about three years, two years ago. I had a, a tumor blocking my small intestine that nobody could figure out why I was dying. Uh, finally, they fixed it, and I'm grateful for that. And my mother had a stroke a year and a half ago. Uh, coronavirus hits. The whole west coast of the U.S. is on fire. I was up there breathing that smoke for several days. So, you know, life is short, and, you know, um, we, we got we to gotta embrace it and, and give our gifts. So uh, I just want to keep writing books and I love doing workshops and seminars. So uh, I, I've had to start doing some uh, virtual workshops online because I had to cancel several in-person ones. But hell, we got to adapt, right? We've, we've been fucking over Mother Nature for centuries. Mother Nature's taken a poke back at us. You know, we got to adapt. So um, yeah, I, I just want to keep putting good stuff out in the world and you know, I appreciate people like you that, you know, allow me to just keep putting stuff out there in the world. Hopefully people hear it as good. Um, but um, yeah, so that's what's up for me. Fair enough. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, so anyway, folks, uh, Dr. Robert Glover, author of No More Mr. Nice Guy and Dating Tips for Men. I highly, highly recommend you check it out. Even even the women of the audience, uh, if you're in a, a relationship uh be it a uh, boyfriend or husband and whatnot, Dr. Glover's content would definitely heavily benefit uh, the men in your life to make the men that you would come to a point where you could better respect them and have a better relationship, which as a result of you being able to respect them better, they'll just be even more loving to you. So it's always going to be there you go. To you, yeah. you know, so and, and, and the, they'll send you text messages with more gratitude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, thank you so much, Dr. Glover, for joining us and being here on uh, this audience. We've been wanting to get you on the show for a very long time. And I'm so glad that you just uh, made it work out for us. It's, it's been fantastic. So and hopefully Thanks. we'll see you again on your next book release for sure. All right, let's do awesome. it. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I had a great time. Let's do it again. All right, certainly. All right, folks, that being said, I'll see you guys later.